Okay. Remember where we, well, actually, we left off three weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> David had heard some very sad news, First Samuel, or Second Samuel chapter 1. Uh, David said to the young man, the Amalekite, I'm just going to go through this because this is a bit of review. Um, How do you know Saul and Jonathan are dead? The man answered them that he saw them on Mount Gilboa and that he saw Saul leaning on a spear with the enemy chariots uh, and charioters closing in on him. Uh, So I killed him, the Amalekite told David, for I knew he couldn't live anyway, so I just took him out. Then he took his crown and his armband and have brought them to you, my lord, so I could get a big fat reward because I know he was your enemy, basically what he's really saying. Uh, Of course, David knows the terrain, and that's one thing why sometimes I stress terrain is because so much of what God is doing is is through the terrain, the geography of this land. Uh, David knew that the chariots were not going to be on Mount Gilboa, but the archers were. And so he knew that this guy was lying. Even though it's in the Bible, his story is not true. So he was a good scavenger, but a bad liar. And um, David saw through his his lie. Uh, Of course, the sad story was is that Saul had lost the battle and he lost his crown. And then from there, we jumped off to a three-week study about the crowns of the Christian life, the rewards at the Bema Seat of Christ. Um, it, it just a subject that it's good to go back to that subject occasionally because you will have a moment in time where you stand before Christ and give an account of your use or misuse of your spiritual gifts. <clears throat> so, but here's the thing about David is even though the, the man Saul had hunted him, had hated him, had tried to kill him numerous times, David saw life through God's perspective. And boy, when you can get that down in your life, that's huge. When you can see God's perspective in your struggles, in your battles, in your failings, when you can see God in all of those areas, that's where maturity really comes because you start to see a much bigger God. So David saw that the Lord's anointed had been killed. Not just Saul, but the Lord's anointed. He saw that the Lord's chosen people had been defeated. Another huge, huge, just heartbreak for David. And last of all, he saw that the Lord's name has been defiled among the heathens. Because it was a battle. <clears throat> the heathens thought that if they conquered, their God is stronger. And again, we, we know that the Lord God is the King of kings, Lord of lords. But in the heathens' minds, they thought they had beaten Jehovah. David composed a funeral song for Saul and Jonathan. We're in 2 Samuel chapter 1. <clears throat> and he commanded that it be taught to the people of Judah. It is known as the Song of the Bow, and it is recorded in the book of Jashar. Your glory, O Israel, lies slain on your heights. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Don't announce the news in Gath. Don't proclaim it in the streets of Ashkelon. Why? Why wouldn't you want the news of Israel's defeat proclaimed in those two cities? <clears throat> Enemy cities, absolutely. Or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice and the pagans will laugh in triumph. How beloved and gracious were Saul and Jonathan. I mean, it's like, whoa, are we talking about the same Saul here? But you see, David saw past the conflicts and he saw God's plan, God's sovereignty in all of it. They were together in life and in death. They were swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of a woman. And again, what David is saying is that Jonathan was willing to step aside in the lineage of the crown and give it to David. And why was Jonathan willing to do that? He knew David was anointed. That's right. He had heard the prophecy from Samuel. And again, when Samuel spoke, it was thus saith the Lord. And so David knew, I'm sorry, Jonathan knew that David was next. He was the one that God had chosen. So th- that is the most amazing thing, that Jonathan had the, the knowledge and the humility to just give it to God's anointed. Huge, huge maturity. So we need to see life from God's perspective, amen, but we also need to see death from God's perspective. I mean, for the Christian According to 1 Thessalonians 4, death is a passage right into glory for the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean you don't grieve for the loss of of the the one that has departed, Um, but we we see life differently and we see death differently because of the hope that we have because of the sacrifice of Christ. So David sees God's hand in Saul's demise. Now, remember for the last year and a half, about the last 16 months, David has learned a whole lot of lessons. And where has David been living for that last 16 months? 
in Philistine. He's been Philistine territory. He's been living in Ziglag, okay? David had been trusting his own insights, leaning on his own strength, <clears throat> until he finally, after 16 months, hit the wall. What was the wall that David hit that finally brought him back to the Lord? Yep. There's a, and what town was that? Ziglag. Ziglag, okay? Ziglag was burned to the ground. David was going up to fight against Saul because he had been pseudo-loyal to King Achish. Um, God miraculously got him out of that commitment because that would have been pretty horrible. David fighting against the troops of Israel, that really wouldn't have gone over. That'd be hard to qualify for a king when you fight against your own country. And so Ziglag was what God brought to David's life to break him, to wake him up, to show him that you don't have the strength to do this. You have to lean on me. I mean, there's been times God has let me hit a wall, you hit a wall, and it, it sometimes the wall can be thick, sometimes it can be thin, sometimes it can be an extended period of time, sometimes it can be very quick, but God wanted to wake David up because living in the Philistine territory was not God's plan for David. So location, location, location. So there's Ziglag on the map, okay? Um, <clears throat> oh, the reason I have prayer number five after Ziglag is because there's nine times in Scripture where David seeks the Lord, seeks after the Lord. He, he goes to God in prayer. Sometimes he does that on his own. Sometimes he does that through Abiathar, the high priest, uh, where he calls for the ephod, where he's asking God specific questions. And through the Urim and the Thurim, these things would light up. I know it sounds kind of like, you know, high-tech LED thing, but that's how God would communicate exact yes or no answers to them. So David called out <clears throat> for Abiathar to bring the ephod, and he asked the Lord, should I move back to one of the towns of Judah? Okay, so he's in Ziglag, which is right on the border of um, Israel and, you know, the Canaan or the Philistine territory. Uh, just real quick, this is Judah and the rest is Israel, okay? Now, remember that the Philistines had pretty much run a pincer move. They had come up north right into the, the, the Escalon Valley, right through there, and they had kind of split Israel in half. You, usually they were just content to fight along the border skirmishes, but because they saw Saul deteriorating, they saw David had already defected, and so many mighty men of Saul's army was defecting to David's army. So the Philistines thought, we're, we're in great, great position to attack. So they move uh, not on border, but they go right into the heart, into the uh, kind of the breadbasket of Israel and do a major attack. So now David is asking, where should I go? So what's the one qualification that David gave to that question? Yeah, Judah. What town in Judah should I go to? He's not saying, you know, uh, what town in all of Israel should I go to? He's saying, what town of Judah should I go to? Okay, so back to our map here. Well, he could go to Beersheba. Okay, that's in Judah, but it's very far south, strategically not very smart. Uh, he could go to Jerusalem, uh, but the timing's not right, and it's already occupied by an enemy force right now. So the Jebusites, so that probably is not, not a good situation. So Hebron would be the next choice. And so the Lord says, go up, David. Asked, where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. So David is going to move to Hebron. This is where he's going to set up base. This is where God wants him to start to reestablish the, the, the kingship in Hebron first. Now, Hebron is one of the oldest cities in all of the world. So it's, it's amazing the history that it has. But there's something interesting about Hebron is that God sends him to Hebron because really David, more than anything else, he needs to re-strengthen his faith. He needs to take time to rebuild his walk with the Lord. Because he's, for the last 16 months, been, been pretty, pretty sparse spiritually. Uh, he's skipped Sunday school every week. He hasn't been to church. Uh, you know, he doesn't even think about Wednesday nights. He's going to skip the fall festival. I mean, David's just been completely checked out. Uh, no quiet times. He ha There's no prayers recorded during that 16 months. There's no psalms that are recorded during that time. So David was very quiet. Of course, he was living a lie. You know, he's pretending to be loyal to the Philistine king, and he's out there the, giving the impression he's attacking Israelites, where the whole time he's attacking Malachites and all these other people. Um, so so David was just really not walking in light. He was walking in deception. But God wants to, to rekindle his love for him. And there's times where God wants to take you 
out of the scene for a little bit and take you to a place where your heart can be replenished in his mercy, in his word, in his goodness. Now, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt, Numbers 13, 22. And you're like, okay, so what? Well, if it's in the Bible, there's a reason it's in the Bible, because God wanted it in the Bible to give us an indication about something. So who in the world would know anything about Egyptian real estate to, to know this fact? I mean, this is a pretty specific little piece of information here that Hebron was built seven years before. Now, Zohan is not just some small little community in Egypt. <clears throat> Zohan is the place where Moses performed the miracles of turning the Nile into blood and bringing the gnats out of the ground. All of those miracles were in the region of Zoan. So Zoan is a hugely significant um, spot. I mean, it would be saying like, you know, the Battle of Gettysburg or the Field of Gettysburg. I mean, it would be something that would, would remind everyone who was familiar with that, that God did something big here in Zoan. This is a very significant place. But Hebron was built seven years before Zoan. And so for that piece of information to come up, that means that Hebron is extremely important. So who do you think would know the history of Egyptian real estate to be able to put that into the Bible? And don't say God. Of course, God knows. But <laughs> Huh? Moses. Gosh, that's right. Moses was an Egyptian prince for 40 years, trained in the ways of the Egyptians. He knew everything because Moses wrote that little piece of information into the scriptures. And he wrote it there to say, as mighty as Zoan was, as powerful as it was with all the Pharaoh's uh, administration and authority based in Zoan, somebody showed up and did something bigger. And that was God through Moses and Aaron. And so when we talk about Hebron, we remember that it is even before Zoan. So God is wanting to take David back to a place of rekindling. He wants to kind of rekindle his love for the Lord. Now, again, Hebron was the home of Abraham. Okay, pretty significant patriarchs. It's also the burial tomb of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, Leah, and the cave of the patriarchs. They're all buried in Hebron. Okay, uh, it's a Levitical city, so it's it's a it's a priesthood city. It was also a city of refuge, um, and God sends David to Hebron. Why would the priest in Hebron be encouraged to have David there? Did the priest like Saul and his leadership? Remember what he did to the priest at Nob? He killed 70 priests of the Lord. I mean, you wipe out almost the entire priesthood in that community. That's not going to go over well with the rest of the Levitical tribe in Israel. So it's about 30, 20 miles from Jerusalem, 15 miles from Gath, and about 38 miles from Ziglag. So it's a pretty hefty hike for them to move everybody to there. But God is, God is more interested in David's heart than where David is living. But he takes him to Hebron because it's a town of huge spiritual significance where many men and women have had their faith deepened and built and God wants to take time to build and deepen David's faith. He needs a time to come back to the roots of the faith that remember God's power and his faithfulness. So this is why I think God sent him to Hebron versus any other city. Could have sent him straight to Jerusalem to go ahead and fight the Jebusites and win the battle, but God needed some time to build into David's life because he, he'd been cold for a long time. Oh, also, you remember that movie Raiders of the Lost Ark? <clears throat> when they, they uncover the city in the sand, the Germans uncover that city, that city was Zoan in the movie. So they were, they were actually picking up correctly on history and, but the problem was is nobody could find Zoe, and they couldn't find this place. They knew it was significant. They knew pharaohs had been based there. It'd be like saying, we don't know where Washington, D.C. is. It'd be like, we can't find any remembrance of it. There's nothing. We just can't find it. We can't locate it. That's how significant it was. And it wasn't until 1939 when a French archaeologist actually found it. And it probably would have been one of the biggest news events in all times, except what happened in 1939 that would eclipse an archaeological dig. Yeah, a war, and that's exactly what happened. So it just kind of got swept under the carpet for a while. But um, they have found some of the most amazing artifacts, undisturbed pharaoh's tombs uh, that would rival even King's Tut. So this is, a, this is a huge place. And I just thought it was very interesting that Moses would throw in that little fact that 
Hebron is even older than Zoan. So, Hebron, take time to return and to strengthen your faith. Sometimes, like David, we need to spiritually relocate to a place or a time where we can recall God's faithfulness, his power, and his grace. Um, You know, have you ever taken just a weekend off or a day off or a Saturday and just gotten away from everything that would be normally you do or, or an extended period of time and just take the word, take your time in your relationship with God and just ask God to build, ask God to speak, ask God to just help rekindle some love, some passion in your life. It's a very healthy thing to do. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. Psalms 116. Maybe we need to take some quiet time, turn off the computer, Facebook, TV, the sports, and all other distractions and hobbies of life, and be still. So we can read, we can remember, we can reflect upon him. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Psalms 46. This is what the Lord says. Jump in. Jump in. I, I just, I read something that this was also the highest elevation, that the city there was, so it would have been easier to defend maybe. Oh, yes. The protection. Uh, For Hebron. Yeah, Absolutely. Hebron. Yes, yes. Yes, it was in the mountain ranges in the central, located in central Israel. You're right, absolutely. That's a very good point because it was it was strategically located and a lot easier to defend um, where it was located in the hills. So good point. No, thank you for adding that. Excellent. What is it called in modern our time now? Is it Hebron. It's still Hebron. Yeah, still called Hebron. Have you been there? Hmm? Have you been there? No, I didn't. I didn't have time to get to Hebron. I was, too in, I was too interested in a few other things when I was over there. <clears throat> Should have. But the problem is, is it's one of the most contested towns. There's about 90% majority Muslim and about 10% Jews. The Jews are very ferocious that live there. They want to protect that, the, the, you know, the tomb here. But unfortunately, it's under the, the wad off of the Muslims. And so it's just lots of turmoil there. And even when I was there in the 80s, it was just too much turmoil in that time to go there. So I stuck to other places that were more fun. Um, Okay, David is finally established in Hebron. David went up to Hebron with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David brought up his men who were with him, everyone with his household, and they lived in the towns of Hebron. I mean, he had probably close to, oh gosh, he had over 10,000 men with him at this point. Their families, the kids, I mean, everybody. So this is a huge relocation of, of force. And so even though Saul's dead, David is going to wait upon his timing because this is, this is pretty significant is that Saul's dead, you would think the next logical step would be for David to step out and say, I'm king. Samuel promised it, I'm king, but <clears throat> David is learning to wait upon God. And he, he's, been, he's realized, I can't keep stepping out in my own strength because it really creates problems. So he says, I'm going to wait upon God's timing. I'm going to let God work out the situation, the circumstances, and make sure that it's God's time when I become king. So what happens? Then the men of Judah finally come to Hebron. So they come to David, and they anoint David king over the house of Judah. Okay? So finally, this is just the tribe of Judah. They're obeying Samuel's Uh, prophecy, his oracle, that David would be God's chosen to lead Israel. But again, it's just Judah at this time. So God had promised David to be the king of all Israel. So now David has to wait for another period of time. I mean, he could push the point. He could try to try to force the issue, but he doesn't do that. In fact, his goal is to unite all the tribes. He, He could declare himself king, but right now, there's a lot of conflict. And who's the conflict with? Yeah, the tribes of Saul, the Benjamites. I mean, they're, they're not real excited about losing their king because as soon as the tribe of Benjamin, who Saul was in control of or from, as soon as Saul's gone, the tribe of Benjamin becomes inconsequential. However, Genesis 49, the scepter would never depart from the feet of Judah. So Judah was the promised scepter receiver, the ruler of Israel. So David, this is so interesting. David's going to use diplomacy, wisdom, creativity to win the hearts of all of them. Now, God is obviously working in all of the hearts of all Israel to bring David to be the the complete king. Um, Well, he lost three sons, and we're going to cover that in one second, but he still does have one son left. Right. 
Are Wait. they like the mad guy? Who? The people that came and anointed David. Would it be similar to what happened with Jesus? In one sense, yes, because they recognized what God was doing, but these were the elders of the different tribes and the different communities in, in Judah specifically, not, not the rest of it. So it would be more that they realized that, because that prophecy, that, that word that Samuel had spoken was well known by now. Everyone had known for the last 10 years, because David was in Saul's service for maybe four or five years. <clears throat> then he's on the run as a fugitive for four or five years. Um, and then he's got this year and a half in the, in the land of the Philistines. So everyone is very familiar with this prophecy. Uh, even Saul is one reason he wanted to kill him. So the elders of the land of the tribe of Judah finally realized that now is the time that we can fulfill this prophecy that David would be, the son of Jesse would be the leader of the tribe, the leader of Israel. So they just acknowledged what Samuel had, uh, had already said. So I wouldn't, kind of like in the Magi in the sense they acknowledge it, but they didn't have any real authority to, to put David as head. They were just recognizing what God had already said would take place. So, so David's first um, solidified his leadership was sending gifts from the Amalekite raid, raid to the elders of Judah. I mean, th this is very smart. David, after they got all that booty from going back to the Amalekites and beating them down and rescuing the wives and the family and the kids. They got a tremendous amount of, you know, herds and flocks and everything you could think of, clothes, gold, silver. And David, what he does is he sends it to all the tribes, all the cities in Judah. Even Hebron he sends gifts to. So all of a sudden, you know, you're the, you're the, the leader of a little town, and all of a sudden these carts start pulling in with all of these clothes and gold and resources with flocks and donkeys and camels. All of this stuff starts showing up. I mean, it's like Christmas in Israel, and they just, can't, they just can't believe it. But it's from David because these tribes, these towns, were faithful to help him and to support him while he was on the run for those four or five years against Saul. So a very smart way, Proverbs says, a gift makes a room for itself. David was winning their hearts. I wouldn't go as far as a bribe. I just would say he was acknowledging their faithful support of him during that time as a, as a fugitive. And so he, he wants to solidify to let them know that I appreciate what you've done for me. And here is a, a gift, a significant gift for you. Then he does the next thing. So as soon as he was anointed king by the, by the elders of Judah, then he says this. When David was told that it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who had buried Saul, he sent them this message. May the Lord bless you for being so loyal to your master Saul and giving him a decent burial. Okay, Jabesh Gilead, the town. It's on the eastern part of the Jordan. So it's in, in Jordan is what we would call it um, proper today. So it's on the other side of the Jordan River. What, why would the town of Jabesh Gilead be loyal to Saul? Do you remember? Remember what happened? They were, they were being attacked by this rogue raiding party. They surrounded the town of Jabesh Gilead, and they said, we, we demand you submit to us, and otherwise we'll kill everyone. And they said, well, just give us seven days to send out help, you know, send out an email to everybody, see if they'll come help us. If nobody comes to help us, we'll submit to you. And then the raiding party said, well, just to make sure you submit to us, we're gonna gouge out every man's right eye. <laughs> well, that didn't go over real well, to speak, because then you wouldn't be able to fight. If, m most swordsmen were right-handed, so if you lose your right eye, it's really hard to fight with a sword. <clears throat> so they were pretty scared, but they sent out the, 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 the request for help. Saul had not been designated king yet, but he had been ordained by Samuel to be the king. He hears that. He becomes furious. He gathers up all the men cuts up the oxen that he was plowing with and sends pieces to all Israel and says, I'm going to do this to everyone's oxen if you don't show up here and help me, you know, save our people in Jabesh Gilead. So it was a pretty, pretty you know, important message. You, get a, you know, you get a carcass in the mail. It's like, hey, show up for this battle. They showed up. They beat back the, the, this rogue um, raiders that were, that were trying to overtake Jabesh Gilead. So you can see why the town of Jabesh Gilead was completely loyal to Saul. He had rescued them in their moment of crisis. So you can bet 
that if David can win over this community, this town, it's going to be huge in helping reunite all of Israel together under David. Okay? Any questions on that? I mean, you can, if, if somebody saved you from having your right eye gouged out and being made a slave, uh, you're going to be pretty loyal to that person. David continues, may the Lord be loyal to you in return and reward you with his unfailing love. And I too will reward you for what you've done. Now that Saul is dead, I ask you to be my, I ask you to be my strong and loyal subjects like the people of Judah who have anointed me as their new king. Okay, this is a hugely wise and diplomatic step. I mean, talk about be wise with your words. This was so smart to do because he's reaching out to one of the most loyal followers of Saul but he's also telling them that, hey, I will be loyal to you just like Saul was, and I'll also protect you. Because if he could win them over, he knew it would strengthen his reign. Also, the town was so loyal to Saul, they're the ones that took the body of Saul and Jonathan and the other two sons off the wall. Because remember, the Philistines had cut their heads off, stripped their body naked, and then hung them up on the city wall. And when the, uh, the people of Jabesh Gilead heard about it, they just said, that's horrible. That's horrible. So at the middle of the night, they trekked about 20 miles, snuck into town, pulled their dead bodies off, and gave them a proper burial. Um, they had risked their lives, really, to, to rescue Saul and his son's bodies from the wall. And the last thing was, is that, can you imagine the Philistines' uh, surprise when they wake up the next morning, go out to laugh at dead Saul hanging on a wall, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he's gone? They're going to find out that the people of Jabesh Gilead did it, and they're going to be out for revenge. They're going to be coming to that. So all of a sudden, uh, Jabesh Gilead is going to need some protection. So for Saul to, for David to send this praise out and also say, I will protect you, basically, that's, that's pretty significant. They're going to jump at that. Okay, well, let's get back to just the quick conflict, okay? Because the house of Saul still does not want to submit. There's going to be an ongoing battle here. So, meanwhile, Abner, son of Ner, he was the commander of Saul's army. He was the, the, the main general. He, would take, he had taken Ishbosheth, and that's a really hard name to say, so I'm just going to call him Ishi, son of Saul, <laughs> and brought him over to Mananiam. Okay, so basically what happened is Abner... He gets the only son that's still alive. Now, why wasn't he at the battle? I know someone had to stay back at Gibeah and, uh, you know, take care of administrations of the government or whatever. But, and why Abner was still alive, too, why he didn't, he didn't perish on the battlefield, I'm not sure either. A um, couple things there. So, but he takes the only son that's left of Saul. He, he's going to anoint him as king, and he's going to take him to Menahem. Okay, so why... Why do you think Abner is taking Ishi from Gibeah, taking him over to Manneum? Why is he getting him out of Gibeah? Protect him. Why? Because the Philistines are overrunning the entire central part of the country there. Okay, But there's more to it than that. This town, it was first named by Jacob. So remember Jacob's been gone for all this time he comes back with his with his two wives and all the kids and the two concubines or the handmaidens and all the flocks and everything he's coming back and who does he have to meet Esau okay so as he's coming back and he's very afraid that Esau is going to kill him so as he's coming back Jacob is very worried very scared he comes to Manium and all of a sudden he sees a giant camp of angels I don't know if they're having a cookout, barbecue, whatever. There's just a giant camp of angels there. And, and Jacob, Jacob says, I'm going to call this place Menem. And basically what the word means, it means two camps. So he, Jacob had his giant camp of, you know, flocks and herds. And also there's God's camp. So basically what Jacob understands is God is reminding me that God is with me. God sends his angels to protect us. He's with me. He's not going to let me down. But this is where Abner takes Ishi. And I just wonder, why, why did he take him to that particular town? And I was wondering if maybe he's trying to, like, recapture the presence of God, um, just like how Jacob had wrestled with God, because this is where Jacob wrestled with God and, you know, said, you know, um, I, I, I want you to give me a, a new name. And so he gives him the name Israel, which means wrestled with God. Um, and then he asked the angel, what's your name? And the angel says, I refuse to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. You don't need to know it. Um, and then, of course, the angel 
for some reason, Jacob was was winning and the angel would win and Jacob, so this thing went on all night this wrestling match and finally the angel touched Jacob's hip socket and the hip socket came out and so Jacob from that point on walked with a limp but he realized that the limp is the reminder that God is always with me so sometimes God will give you an affliction or a, or something that just you wish would was gone but sometimes God gives you an affliction as a gentle reminder that I'm always with you um, I know it seems crazy, but let this affliction or this difficulty or this hardship just be a, a, a subtle reminder that I'm always with you. I'm never going to let you down no matter what. So I wonder if just Abner was trying to tap back into the history, the historicalness of Maniam and was just trying to let all of Israel know that, hey, God's with us in this battle. Ishi should be king. He's Saul's son. This is the way it should be. It should not be David, okay? There Abner proclaimed Ishi king over Gilead, Jezreel, Ephraim, Benjamin, the land of Asherites, and all the rest of Israel. Abner doesn't like David at all, and he's not going to submit to David. Why? Why, why is not Abner going to submit to David? He doesn't think he's king. Doesn't think he's king. He loses power. He's going to lose his job. I mean, you know, somebody comes in and they're your new boss, but you really don't like them because they're going to they're going to kick you out. They're going to let you go. Him, hmm? David got close to the king. Didn't he really kill Abner? He he could have he could have killed Abner. You're right. He yeah. could have killed Abner. He made fun of him, like he couldn't the very first time that Abner ever met David was when Abner brings David as a teenager to Saul after Saul, after David had killed Goliath. So that was the very first encounter Abner ever had with David. I think, but the bottom line is he doesn't want to get killed. So, but the real thing is he's resistant to God's word. That's the problem. Abner doesn't want to submit to God. Well, real quick, let me just tell you a little bit about Abner as we'll wrap this up. Okay, there's a, there's a guy, Abiel. He has two sons, okay, Kish and Ner, their brothers. Those brothers get married. They have sons. Kish has Saul. Ner has Abner. So these guys are first cousins. Is that correct? Is that how that works? Okay. They're first cousins. I always get that stuff mixed up. Okay. They're first cousins. Jonathan has three sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. Those three sons all die in Mount Geboa, okay, fighting with Saul, where Saul dies. There's one more son, Ishbosheth, okay. Uh, he wasn't there at the, the battle, so he's the last son of Saul. And so, but Abner's the power broker. He's the commander of the army. He, he's the one that wields the power. Uh, um, he's also very pragmatic. He, he can kind of sense which way is the wind blowing, but he thinks at this point he still has enough forces and troops and power to pull off the house of Saul still leading Israel. So that's the direction he's going to go, okay? Uh, Ishbosheth, son of Saul, was 40 years old when he became king, and he ruled for Menem for two years. Meanwhile, the people of Judah remained loyal to David. David made Hebron his capital, and he ruled as king of Judah for seven and a half years. So it's going to be seven and a half years before David actually becomes king over all of Israel. Now the war between the house of Saul and the house of David was protracted, and David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. So here's how we'll wrap this up. God provided the right people to build up David. You can never underestimate the value, the safety, the wisdom of having right friends. This is so critical. Now, these are the number of soldiers armed for battle who came to David at Hebron to turn Saul's kingdom over to him in accordance with the word of the Lord. So in 1 Chronicles 12, God is bringing men, soldiers, support to David to reassure him, this is what I want. This is what's going to take place. I'm bringing you the right people to build up your army because you're going to need an army. Why? Why is David going to need an army? He's surrounded, by enemies. he's surrounded mostly by enemies God's going to work out the situation with, with Abner and the house of Saul although it's going to be a battle but the bigger battle is going to be the Philistines that's going to be the bigger battle God is going to be preparing David and encouraging David with the resources he needs for the battles that are coming sometimes God will be doing something in your life to help prepare you for the battles that are coming so these are some of the people the men of Judah bearing shields and spears were 6800 the tribe of Simeon were 7,100 brave warriors for battle. Benjamin, Saul's tribe, 3,000. Most had remained loyal to Saul's house until then. Uh, the men of Issachar, men who understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. 
uh, 200 with all their relatives under them. This is interesting because the men of Ishakar, they realized what was happening. They stepped, stepped back and looked at the big picture. They realized this is what God's doing in Israel. We're going to go with the son of Jesse. That's what God wants us to do. All these men of war, raid for battle, came to Hebron, fully determined to make David king over all of Israel. And all the rest of the Israelites were of one mind to make David king. The men spent three days there with David, eating, drinking. The families had supplied provisions for them. Also, their neighbors from as far away as Issachar, Zebulun, and Naphtali came bringing food. There was great joy throughout the land of Israel. Basically, people were getting fed up with Saul. His policies, his administration, horrible. All he was focused on was killing David and not protecting the borders. And all of a sudden, the people started realizing this is a horrible, horrible situation. I'm not going to make any comments on that. Okay. <laughs> so be, make sure you're surrounded with the right friends. And this is part of your responsibility. You can never underestimate the value of safety of the right friends for you. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. And that's not the rock band from the 70s. Bad company. Those are the people you associate with your... <laughs> yes, you're right. And they were getting it from the Bible. They probably didn't even know it. But the, the company is your companions, your close contacts, your, the people that you are being together with. That's what the word company means. But it also talks about communication, discourse, what's spoken, what's heard. Um, and the truth, the teachings, the doctrines that we hear, that you follow, those can affect you more. And what was the doctrine that Paul was specifically talking about? Let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. What a horrible philosophy. What a horrible teaching. That is basically saying... Live for the temporal value system, the TVS. Live for the temporal. Don't worry about that. There is no eternal. So when you die, you're dead. You just bury in the ground and the worms eat your body. That's horrible. Horrible for anyone. The eternal value system is what we need to focus on. This is what Paul was relating to. So people were basically telling the Christians in Corinth, hey, you don't have to worry about the future, worry about eternity. There is no eternity. Just do whatever you want to do. You, you want to fornicate, fornicate. You want to eat and be a glutton, be a glutton. You want to steal, steal. It does, there's, do whatever you want to do. Well, I mean, sign me up for that religion. Yeah, the flesh loves that. You know, hey, that's great. But that's not the truth. Make sure your close friends speak truth and wisdom to you. He who walks with the wise will be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. Make sure you're the right friend to those who are around you. And I just thought, you know, not only do I want the right friends around me, but I want to be the right friend for those that are around me as well. And that means I need to know the word. I need to be walking with the Lord. I need to be making sure that the truth is in me so that I can be speaking the truth. Otherwise, whatever's in the heart, you're going to be speaking. So have the right friends and be the right friend. And next week, we'll be talking about little consequences of conflict, betrayal, and murder. Because the conflict between Abner and the house of Saul with the house of David is going to get very, very brutal. And there's a few things we can learn from that. Questions, comments?